This is episode 12. I am going to be talking about... This is an essay from C.S. Lewis called God in the Dock. It's not actually his title for it. It sounds like the, the guy who compiled this collection of essays renamed it. Um, Lewis originally called this Difficulties in Presenting the Faith to Modern Nonbelievers. So I can see why this guy would choose to rename it. But Lewis's title is um, informative as well about um, what he was doing. I, I think this showed up in a magazine or I'm not exactly sure. I don't remember the name of it. So, I hadn't read this in a long time. I thought of it when I was recording episode 10, which was on universal salvation. So I'll get to why I thought of it then. Um, but it was interesting to read again. It's really short. I, this video is probably going to be pretty short, but I just kind of want to hit the main points and then sort of discuss why it came to mind during the universal salvation um, topic. So he starts the essay. Um, once again, his title was Difficulties in Presenting the Faith to Modern Unbelievers. So he's just sort of listing some of the easy ones. Um, the age of his audience, their education level, um, which is obvious that kind of, you know, that's no matter what your topic is, you're going to have to take those things into account. He talks about the adversarial creeds of the time, which a lot of these are the same as they were back then. Materialism, theosophy, spiritualism, um, British Israelites, I'm not sure <laughs> why he brought those up, but um, Marxism, um, he talks about how the young people that he talked to, to, that he interacts with, that he interacted with during his time, how they were very skeptical of history, and at the same time they were very trusting of science, uh, which I, it's probably a fair description of um, the university these days. Um, I would venture to guess that they were probably better, better educated back then. Um, my opinion of academia is probably not that informed, but um, because I haven't been in college in a long time. But from what I hear, it doesn't sound great. Um, he brings up difficulty of language, which um, is obviously just as relevant today as it was then. Um, so let me just read this quote. It's a little obscure, but it, maybe more um, relevant to his time or the people he was interacting with than it is now. But I do think it illuminates the difficulties that he's talking about. So he says that potential means not possible, but power. That creature means not creature, but animal. That primitive means rude or clumsy. That rude means often scabrous, obscene that the Immaculate Conception, except in the mouths of Roman Catholics, means the virgin birth. A being means a personal being. A man who said to me, I believe in the Holy Ghost, but I don't think it is a being, meant, 
I believe there is such a being, but that it is not personal. On the other hand, personal sometimes means corporal. When an uneducated Englishman says that he believes in God, but not in a personal God, he may simply mean, he may simply and solely, <laughs> let's try that again. He may mean simply and solely that he is not an anthropomorphist in the strict and original sense of the word. So, once again, I I think the, the, a lot of those terms are terms we're not bandying about much these days, but I do think we sense these limitations of language and how different language can be used and how so much of it depends on where you heard these words, where, you know, the source of them, how, you t how you've talked about them, if you've talked about them. Um, so, um, I just thought that was, um, I think it illuminates the problem. So, uh, this is another quote where he says, Apart from the linguistic difficulty, the greatest barrier I have met is the almost total absence from the minds of my audience of any sense of sin. And, you know, I think sin was becoming a tricky term when Lewis was around, and it's um, almost a non-existent term now. It's if you're not in a religious context, I don't think people even use it, which sort of makes sense. So, you know, if you take sin from the perspective, sort of as I, I understand it, maybe this is the best way I can say it. There's a creator God who created the earth, the universe, everything that we see. In it. Um, and he put us here. And he put us here for a reason. And there was a sort of standard that we were supposed to live by. Um, whether you want to take the Garden of Eden and the tree of... <sighs> tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Hopefully I said that right whether that's reality or whether that's just a myth. To me, the general idea is he put us here, but he, there were some boundaries to us um, living in harmony with him. Do this, don't do that. Um, and because we have agency, because we have free will, we did what we weren't supposed to do. And we've sort of been suffering the consequences of that ever since. That's sin. That's we were created into something that had um, we were created by a person who had a vision for us, who had a vision for how all of this would go. But he also gave us the opportunity to choose other than that, and we chose other than that. Um, If everything that I just laid out is not true, and we're here by accident, there was a bang that randomly happened, and somehow there was always, somehow matter showed up, and somehow a bang happened, and somehow we ended up accidentally out of this bang. If that is the reality, then there's no such thing as sin. I mean, other than what we want to define it. And obviously that definition has... Um, if there were a God, it would be a fixed thing. If there weren't a God, it would be changing all the time. And sin, I don't think that really works, you know. 
if you take God out of it, you might be better to say something like, um, this is the behavior we think is the best, this is the behavior we think is the worst, or um, least advantageous, or whatever. So, if people have been growing up less and less religious over the years, less in Lewis's time, even less now, then you can see how this um, absence of any sense of sin, you can see how that makes a lot of sense. Here's the next quote. Whether, as I believe, the proletariat is more self-righteous than other classes, or whether educated people are cleverer at concealing their pride, this creates for us a new situation. The early Christian preachers could assume in their hearers whether Jews metuentes, probably butchered that, or pagans a sense of guilt. Thus the Christian message was in those days unmistakably the evangelium the good news. It promised healing to those who knew they were sick. We have to convince our hearers of the unwelcome diagnosis before we can expect them to welcome the news of the remedy. So it, obviously it's just um, uh, expanding on that absence of any sense of sin and um, if you don't believe in sin, then um, you're not at odds with your creator because there isn't a creator. And the standard is what we decide the standard is. So, um, let me just get into the last quote and then I can kind of summarize. <laughs> The ancient man approached God, or even the gods, as the accused person approaches his judge. For the modern man, the roles are reversed. He is the judge. God is in the dock. He is quite a kindly judge. If God should have a reasonable defense for being the God who permits war, poverty, and disease, he is ready to listen to it. The trial may even end in God's acquittal, but the important thing is that man is on the bench and God in the dock. So it was, this, it was that last part, especially, that came to mind when um, I was dipping my toes in that universal salvation thing. Because I don't know that I've ever heard anybody come out and say this, but maybe this has just been in the back of my own mind that... Um, if universal salvation isn't true, then I'm not going to believe in God. <sighs> and so that's what sort of brought my mind to this God the doc thing. God, if you live up to my standard and you um, judge people in a way that I understand and that I think is fair, then I'm going to believe in you. But if not, then I'm going to revoke my belief in you. Once again, I don't think I've any, heard anybody say that. I just, I can't help but sort of wrestle with that sort of rationale as I'm trying to process this. Maybe it's easier to believe in God, or maybe it's easier to believe that God is just if sometime down the line everyone is saved. Maybe that's... Um, for certain people, maybe that's absolutely true. But I... It also seems important to at least have some spot in your rationale for wrestling with, what if that's not true? What if, even if I don't understand it at all, if I'm going to believe in God, I have to believe he's just. 
And if a just God sends people to hell, I have to believe he can do that and be just, even though it sounds cruel to me, or I don't like it, or that means him condemning people that I liked and that I, that I didn't want to see separated from God or I didn't want to see suffer or... Um, I mean, I guess that's as true for me as anyone, you know. People who I don't see as believers or people who have already died, people who have died, people who haven't died yet, but it certainly seems like they're not going to be um, converted to any sort of belief. So, I understand that struggle, but I also really like what Lewis is saying here, that if I put the pieces of the universe in their proper place, it is God that is judging me. It is not me that is judging God. And my understanding is so limited compared to his that me making judgments on him is ridiculous. Um, and I have to keep that in mind. I have to understand that I am one of billions and billions and billions of things that he's created. Now, obviously, humans are different because in some sense we're created in God's image and we're created with free will, if you believe such a thing. Um, but still, my position in relation to God's position, um, I think that's very insightful of Lewis to say that somewhere we have taken license with the freedom that God has given us. Because when we say something wrong, he doesn't strike us with lightning. He doesn't strike us dead. And if there is a God and he's given us that patience, or he's given us that freedom, he's also exhibiting how patient he is with us. Because you hear on a daily basis his creation saying really, really stupid things about him and about each other and about everything. And um, he lets a lot of really, really bad people walk the earth and get away with all sorts of terrible things. And I also have to keep in mind that he lets me get away with a lot of things because I do a lot of things wrong. And I am not measuring up to the standard. And all of that is true. Um, but what Lewis wrote here seems to be a really good reminder that when my mind is thinking about things as I ought to think about them, God is the judge and, um, I'm the one in the dock. And when I start moving those pieces around, I'm in a, precarious position. I'm not seeing things as they are, or as I ought to see them, if you believe such things. So, that's pretty short. Um, I hope it made sense. Uh, there's another essay in this collection called Bulverism. I think I'm going to talk about that one again, too, because I remember liking that one a lot, and it's something I haven't read in a long time. So, but I think there's something else I'm going to do first, but as I've said before, I'm bad at predicting what's going to come next, so we'll see. But anyway, um, hopefully that was helpful in some way. Thanks for listening.